Hello, we are diving into Galatians 5 and we're going to do some work on the internet. I want to introduce you to two resources that I use extensively and when you want to do a little bit more, when you want to stand a little deeper. So it's real, they're really easy to use and so I want to equip you a little bit with them. And also we're going to have a delightful time in chapter 5. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for all the men and women that have gone before us that have worked so hard and the, just even the IT people now that we have the internet to use to know you better and to study your word and I ask you to give us good resources and help us be discerning of how to use technology well for the kingdom and Father just open up our hearts, our eyes, our minds, our words together with one another and also to connect to you and your word. Thank you so much. Okay, so one of the things that as I've been studying, it's very interesting, different places that I'm studying are talking about the same thing or they're overlapping and I see some relationship between Galatians here, uh, being taught James 2 yesterday and somewhere else it surfaced again. And thinking about something that's confusing is sometimes, of course context is important. You have to know what it is, the Old Testament or New Testament, believers, non-believers, all of this. But even within a passage being written to believers, there's sometimes where the context of what it's talking about is talking about initial salvation, and other times it's talking about subsequent, to, like our walk, or then goes on to what we have in glory when we're finished on this earth. And the confusion, I think, is giving us, a, there's a lot of confusion with difficult passages. James 2, right there, our passages tonight, it's the same thing. For example, we've said that there are two definitions we use of grace. The first grace is the gift at, all over, anything God does for us is grace, because it's a gift, we haven't earned it, he owes us nothing. But the grace we know in Ephesians 2 of by grace have you been saved, we're talking about initial salvation is a gift of God that cannot be earned. But we've talked continually where we see in scripture, it's talking about the grace to live between initial salvation and glorification and going to heaven, our death. Between those, our physical death, so we have eternal life, um, that between those there's a grace that's the empowerment to do his will and to walk with him. And I think that this concept of seeing two different places historically where the word could be applied um, would be initial salvation versus is this something that we need all the time. I'm thinking and haven't explored it fully, but in James 2 where he's talking about faith without works is dead, he's not talking about initial salvation, he's talking about our walk and talking about what it's like now that my faith without works to show and to grow is dead, but not for initial salvation. And that's where a lot of bad theology comes from. So I'm just telling you to be warned about it because there are three things. In salvation, there is, I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. So at the point of regeneration and new birth, I was saved. I have been saved. And then right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, because remember last week we talked about He was our guarantee that was sealing us to have our inheritance. Peter tells us it's there forever. It's going to be ours for eternal. It's not corrupted or anything happening. And the Holy Spirit seals it for us and is the promise that that's going to happen. So right now we are being saved. And all the verses of perseverance, in um, Philippians, work out your own salvation. That's not initial salvation. That is working from the inside out the new life that he's given us by the power of the Spirit, by his grace, and through the agency of our faith. So this is what I'm talking about. So start looking like the passages we're going to look here, because there are some hard verses in here, um, sort of like there are in James, going, what? What are you talking about? I thought I was saved by grace, and it's, and it's still that problem. So start looking at difficult passages, 
that possibly this would shine some light on it to understand it. Is there is there a question or a thought on this? Okay, just and it's not like these verses are this and I don't know a list of that, but it would be contextual to not you certainly cannot lose your salvation. In so many of these verses, people use them to prove, oh, so you really aren't saved, you have to work. And that, we're going to say today, it can't be. It is either north or it's south, I mean east or west. It can't, there's no blending of east and west. Oil, water, poison, you know, clean water. It has to be, so it can't be a blending, so what is it? And I think this thought process might help us figure it out. Because you see, we have to figure all this out. I don't give you all the answers. <laughs> I'm telling you. All right. So the last verse of chapter 4, which is the context for where chapter 5 starts, says, 430 says, So brothers, we're not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Free of what? Slave of what? What are we talking about? We use uh, Sarah and Hagar. Did we finish that? we walk all the way through that? I don't think so. Because hmm. I can't remember if we walked all the way through it. Sorry. I'm just now saying I don't remember talking about it. Did we? We did. No. Now let's go back to 22. <laughs> Allegorically, did we, we didn't talk about Hagar, Mount Sinai, and Jerusalem. Okay, I was just thinking we got along a lot further than we had. Um, Okay, because we did talk about childbirth, so we talked about 19. Um, okay, so let's go back to verse 20. So we'll have a little more context than I was planning on. Um, he says, I wish I could be present with you and change my tone, for I'm perplexed about you. He's so frustrated. Remember early he said, oh, Galatians, who has bewitched you? So he's, it's like someone you know really well, and they're doing something really stupid. And you're just going, I love you so much. What are you thinking? Okay, that's what he's talking about. He's so frustrated. You know the truth. Why are you struggling in this? Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, because the struggle here is Judaizers, they're called, are coming in and saying it's really good. We're Christians. This is great. Now let's put in the law of the Old Testament. And we even talked about, we have friends in our group here who are struggling actually this week with friends who have said, yeah, we're New Testament believers, now let's get under the law and start practicing the law. And that's what these false teachers are coming in and saying, this is really good, now this is how we wash our hands, this is what we do, we have a Sabbath week. And they start, fulfill, they start doing all the law, which was the picture of Christ to begin with. We got the real thing, we don't have to look at pictures anymore. You know, we, I have a good friend and her husband has been... Um, I can't think of the word, starts with a D, deposited's not the word, overseas with the army. And so all she had were pictures and video pictures. Well, now he's back. She didn't walk around looking at pictures of him anymore. She's looking at the real thing. And so that's what he's saying. Remember, that was a picture. That's done with. Why would we have a picture when we have the real thing? We have the living Christ Messiah resurrected with us. Why would we look at that? So that's why he's so frustrated with them. Why are, you, why are you listening to this? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Okay, this goes back to Genesis 16, 17, 21. I encourage you to go read it if you don't know the story well. So God promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, that he would be the father of Jesus Christ in lineage, the offspring. He didn't use his name, but we know that's what he's talking about. And he said, this will come from your body. And he got really old. He goes, hey, do I need to use like my servant or something? What have what, I what, what about this? Because he believed God was going to do it. But he was kind of saying, so how about if we do it in a roundabout way? And God said, nope, it's going to be your body. This is good. And so he just got older and older and older and older and got up 90. And he started getting really old. And uh, Sarah was very far past childbearing years. And so, like all of us, go, wow, this is a really good thing that God wants to do. I think he's too slow. I'll figure a much better way of doing it. For example, a lot of us wives sometimes, it's called nag. 
<laughs> because we think God's not working fast enough in our husband's life and he's not doing, so we need to tell him again and tell him how, and we nag. Or we do it with our children, nagging. Now, of course, there's a place for conversation, but the nagging, you all know what we're talking about. Or something you want and you're con you feel that it's biblical not to go into debt, that's not happening fast enough, so you're thinking, may God will bless you're going into debt so it can happen faster. Particularly if it were something very good, say, I don't know, I don't want to name anything, but to go deeply in debt when you know God's told you he didn't want you to do it. That's what we're talking about. And Abraham likes going, look, how's Jesus ever going to get born? Didn't say that, but how's Jesus going to get born if I don't have a baby? So Sarah's going, that's true. And so she offered him her, her servant, Hagar, to be a substitute, to be a surrogate mother for this child. And, he, and Abraham said, oh, okay, let's do it. So they completely took the entire supernatural process out of God's hand, and they did it their way. Mm -hmm. Now, God superintended this story because Hagar is actually a slave, and Sarah is actually a free woman and not a slave. And so if you know the story, Ishmael was the first son, physical son that he had, but he's not the son of promise. He's just a son, some offspring. And so then, of course, 13 years later, he actually gave him um, Isaac, whose name is Laughter, because Sarah goes, <laughs> who in the world would have thunk? Okay? And so they, this was done supernaturally. It's absolutely impossible. There's no way. So it was supernatural based on the covenant promise of God. Okay, that whole story, which you ought to go back and read, now that you understand so much more, go back and read those. Instead of it just being an old history story, now you go, oh my goodness. This is what we do all the time. And so he's saying it's just like that. Preempting God's act of grace and power and mercy and supernatural by trying to do it my way. In this case, it was literally a physical act to get something to happen that should have been the supernatural impacting the physical. And that's what he's using. Does, do you know the story? Do you follow what I'm... Does this make sense? Okay, so let's see. He says, um, verse 22, For it's written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by the free woman. That's Hagar and Sarah. And it's amazing. Go back and read how kind God is and protecting of Hagar and of Ishmael, both of them. Um, but the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, literally, totally unsupernatural, truly just an act of flesh, both spiritual flesh and physical flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through the promise. So this is the promise. And so it's in our spiritual lives and everything else. God's given us promise, and he wants us to act that way. And the Galatians are going, eh, not good enough. We really need to help God along here. Which is what Sarah was saying. Hey, Abraham, why don't we just kind of help God along? And he's saying, Galatians, what are you thinking? Did you help God along to get yourself saved? No. Then why do you suddenly think you have to help him along and come up with some kind of things to do to help the kingdom of God and your spiritual life to grow. This one. Who has bewitched you? So here's this picture, and we understand because it's happening to us. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. I'm glad he told us that, but this is a picture. Okay, because what do we know about the Old Testament and the New Testament? The Old Testament tends to be a what of the what, and what is it? Physical. It's a physical picture of a spiritual truth. Was this a physical picture of a spiritual truth? Yes. And so he's getting ready to develop it. And this is an excellent example. If you or somebody you know doesn't understand the difference and they say, well, Red Sea crossing, man in the wilderness, not having these diseases, something they pull out of the Old Testament as a physical example, use this to show them, see, this is a physical example of a spiritual truth. And that's what most of the Old Testament was. Going into exile, this destruction, whatever it is, they are pictures 
concrete pictures just like this. Ishmael was a real person. My son-in-law's family are all Muslim. No, 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 not all are practicing Muslims, but they're Muslim because of Ishmael. The line to Ishmael, that's where the uh, Islam has come. So look at everything. One act of sin and look at the destruction and the pain and the loss that's come from it. Um, we just never can contain the results of sin and how far that death will travel. Okay, so he says, okay, now you can interpret this allegorically. These two women are two covenants. One is Mount Sinai. What happened on Mount Sinai that's really famous? The law was given. That's Moses. right. That's where Moses went up and he stayed up there and there was thunder and lightning and if you've ever seen the old Ten Commandments, his finger comes down and writes on the thing, which it did say it was written by the finger of God. Okay, so this is Mount Sinai. So it is the spiritual or physical picture. Physical. It's a physical picture of a spiritual truth. So Mount Sinai, but the children that Mount Sinai come from, from Hagar representing it, are slavery to the law. What makes us enslaved to the law? What's enslaving about the law? We can never keep it. We can never keep it. Was it ever designed to be kept? No. Was it ever designed to get us saved? No. What was it designed to do? To show us sin. To show us that we need it mm -hmm. so much. But it doesn't work. Actually, his list, but we all have our list. So I want you to be thinking today, what is your list in your mind that this is what I need to do or not to do to be a better person, to please God, to straighten my life out? And I'm not talking about wisdom and discipline and maturity. I'm talking about a regulation list of... Um, checklist of I need to give money, I need to teach this class, I need to um, I don't know we all have our different ones this bad thing happened because I didn't do this and, and I'm not talking about I'm speeding so I'm getting a traffic ticket, I'm talking about your heart, what rule keeping do you have, so we don't, we don't worry about circumcision, he's going to talk about it here, that's not an issue for us, but you do have some list of I'm bad when I do this, I'm good when I do this. And I'm not talking about morally. I'm talking about your own list. So be thinking of that for you. Because that's what he's talking about here. Okay, so Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and she corresponds to the present day Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. In Judaism, they're in slavery because they still think they have to fulfill the law. Who fulfilled the law? Jesus. So it's done. Uh, but the new, but the Jerusalem above is free. If you read, um, it's referred to when we talk about Abraham in Hebrews 11. He talked about the city, whose foundation is God. And then the last couple pages, oh, a revelation. It talks about the new Jerusalem. That's what we're talking about: the Jerusalem above, the free kingdom of God. When we're done with this earth. Um, but that new free Jerusalem is free. She's our mother. For it's written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear, and break forth and cry, cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than one of a, has a husband. This is still long, but it's, it's talking about being free by not being in the law, and how many people, everybody follows the law. That's the default, is to follow some kind of law, whatever it is. Even if it's grabbing all the gusto you can get, that's your law. You know, have to, oh, I don't want to name any things, but whatever it is can be very hedonistic. But it's good people do this, bad people do this. I'll please God if I do this. I feel good about myself when I do this. And I'm not talking about, again, I'm not talking about a moral thing particularly, but a heart thing. Now you brothers, like Isaac, this is us, are children of promise. But just if it, as the time, but, but just as at the time he was who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael persecuted him who was born in the spirit. So also it is now. Um, this is really true. I have it happened this week in our home with I mean in my family with one of my children. This is saying 
those who are not walking according to the Spirit and trying to not fulfill the law themselves but walk with Christ get persecuted in a big way sometimes. But this was a situation where in a classroom and there was blatant cheating going on mm -hmm. and only one person didn't participate. And there's a lot of hit back and we don't know what there's going to be for someone who chose, for the one who chose not to cheat. So it really was persecution. Now, the law was do what you want to do and there's no standard of morality here in this case, but she was persecuted for choosing to do the right thing. You know, you go to college or high school, you're persecuted if you study and make good grades and enjoy learning and, anyway, it's a different world out there. Okay, are you following this? Is it making sense? Yeah? Well, good. Okay, whoever, what did Jesus say? If they hate me, they will hate you. So, we have to make sure why we rub against people, or why people make fun of us, or ridicule us, or push back. But if we're walking in the Spirit, lots of times that's not embraced and appreciated, it's ridiculed. Even in a family, sometimes even in marriages, like this, in a classroom situation, with no condemnation, it was just not participating in the wrong thing. And uh, it can even happen in church settings that you are you feel the freedom not to participate or to do something a certain way, and you get persecuted, rejected. You're a secondhand Christian if you don't do what we do. So that's why we have to know the word very well and listen and be obedient so that which is essential remains essential and that which is style just remains style. Or it's okay. You can do this, I, I'm not participating, or it's not for me. So that's why we have to know the word so well, so we can walk in grace with everybody else. But don't be surprised, we'll be reading this as we walk all the way through the New Testament, you know, don't be surprised about the fiery trial you're going through, okay? Look what they did to all the disciples. Uh, verse 30, but what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So that physically happened in the Old Testament. In this case, it's saying, we are not from the slave, but of the free. Something, if you'd like an extra homework assignment, I would go back and read these chapters of Galatians and put slave, I mean, save, unsaved, free, slave, and find all the things. See, unsaved versus saved for um, slave. To free, and particularly chapter 4, but that's because he really gets into it. That's supposed to be in hell. Okay? And just make a list and see what you come up with all the way down. Uh, it goes in a little bit to chapter 5 as well. We're going to be doing some of this. But just you're looking for something to do in your time in the Word, this will be a good one so you can really see, um, have it laid out. Okay, you're all real quiet. I've been teaching here. Is there a question where you go, I kind of follow you, but I don't understand this, or what about this? No, your teaching was so good, we understand everything. This is good. So, Cheryl, when you see salvation in the New Testament, are you always thinking, is this initial salvation, or is this our walk? A lot of it's initial salvation. Okay. But, see, like, work out your own salvation. And it says, um, Peter-ish over there, it talks about to obtain something, the desire of our soul, your salvation. Mm -hmm. And people use these verses to say, see, you have to keep the list of rules. Who makes up the rules? Okay. 
That's the deal. Who makes up the rules? This church makes up this rule. This, this group is up at this Bible study makes that. Your family makes that. You make your own list. Uh -huh. mm, they don't. We do. They, they're, oh, oh, their pastor wears a robe. Oh, clearly not <laughs> truly spiritual. Okay, they're not, you know, whatever it is. It's just rules, rules, rules. But that's not initial salvation. Initial salvation goes before the, <laughs> before the foundation of the world, Romans 8.28. And one, that's, something happens in time. And then the rest is the working out of it. So that's not initial salvation. That's sanctification and being saved, which is what um, sanctification is all about. But can you lose salvation if it is an active history of being having your dead heart taken and a new heart given to you? Yes or no? no. What? No. And if you really go, well, I had to say that, but I don't really believe it, come talk to me. Okay, because I really want to show you from Scripture, because it is incredible comfort and security because now I don't have to work, I have to let the Spirit do it. And I don't have to, I don't have to make up my own little rules. Alright, anything else? Now, I want to show you, we're going to look at the internet here for a second. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. We're going to look at this verse. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to your yoke of slavery. So, you at home, we're going to pause it for a second, get it set up here, and then I'm just going to show you um, these particular uh, resources and websites. Okay, so, uh, pretty low-tech way of showing it, but, so this is the website I'm talking about. It's either called Bible CC or Bible uh, Hub, and I use it all the time. Outside of my Bible, maybe Google, um, for verses, I use this so very much. Uh, Bible Way or whatever the other one is, it doesn't have the access to some of the resources that are here. So this is why um, I really love this, the Bible Hub. And I'm going to show you just something, okay? So you can go to different versions of the Bible that you want, you can type in right here a, a word or a passage. Uh, there's lots and lots of tools, and I have absolutely no idea what all these are because I don't have time to go do them all. Okay? So I usually use the ESV, but also Parallel tells me the verse is a version. So I'm going to be, let's see, I want Galatians 5. One. So, we are. So it comes up with Galatians 5 1. Slowly, but it comes up. And so you can see at the top of the toolbar there, there are versions. You can choose your version or commentary. Um, but what we're going to do here, let me show you. Okay, so see what we have here on the left side are different versions of Galatians 5.1. And then this is one that gives it a little bit of context. Mm -hmm. Then here's some cross-reference, some other verses that have to do with the same subject. And then on the right side down here, Treasury of Scripture Knowledge takes certain words, like the word stand, which is in here, and it gives different verses that have it. Or other verses about the subject of liberty. And so that's what this is. So there's quite a bit, if you never even go off this page. I use this all the time. Mm -hmm. All right, so specifically, what I want to do is I want to show you how to access Greek, which is the original language, and just take a couple of little steps. So you've heard people talk about it, you've never done it yourself. It's not daunting, and I will give you just a bite so that you can now go and look up words. If you hear them say, well, actually the word in the original Greek or the original language means um, a step, uh, uh, like a steps that are in sequence, like 
staircases or a ladder, which gives you a visual picture, and it just expands the words. So the God chose the, <laughs> like we talked about last week, to let Alexander the Great take the Greek language every, across this portion of the world, and Greek is the perfect, incredible language. It's not, Hebrew is excellent, but it's, you have to be very skilled in it to really get down. And then it really is specific. But Greek, without being very skilled like me, you can know a whole lot. So here we have, did you see where, I'm sorry, did you see I clicked on, clicked on the word Greek? Mm -hmm. And that took us here. So here we have, and there we are, and it's actually in the order of the Greek words. And here it is actually in Greek. Here is the transliteration, in the, well, the translation in English with the words. And then this over here tells us their definitions. So maybe, like in this, I want to know the word freedom. Because it says he set us free down there and freedom. And I look at them and actually they're the same word. If you see the number on the far left hand, one is 1657 and one is 1659. And we can see and da 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 that they are really basically the same word, just like in English. Freedom set us free. So um, it's, <clears throat> I want to say, well, I wonder if there's anything to know about that word. So if I want to learn the definition and more information, I go way over here. So if you have your um, phone or your, you at home, you can be doing this, listening to me, and you can go on your, uh, the internet, you with phones if you want to. I click on that number. And up comes. Lots of information. There's that elusive blah, 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 word in the Greek. I mean, like if we looked up love, one of the words for love would be agape. We know a little word agape. So you can learn. So then there's more in depth. And this is the fun part of Bible study because you can get into so many rabbit trails and you're going to study one thing and suddenly you're way over studying because you find a fascinating verse or what does that verse say? And so it, 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 it don't be intimidated instead of really use it. So there we have, and it has all the details of it. Um, it tells us that it's a noun, the thing, this is the word freedom. And then down here in the usage, it says, especially a state from slavery. Okay, so this is exactly what Paul's talking about. Um, the concept of freedom versus slavery, which is the very words he's been using. So that's why Greek is so great. The word actually says freedom from slavery, which is it's freedom from slavery that Christ has set us free from slavery. I mean, that's basically what it's saying. So it's very specific. It seems to me when I did this, right down here where it says helps, sometimes there's a real... Uh, more information here for word studies. Right here, this is the base word. And so I like this because it, down here it says free, liberated, free to realize our destiny in Christ. Uh, just the wording, I love that. Y'all see where I'm going down to? <laughs> A lot of people see obeying Christ and being submitted to Him and his word and his reign as restrictive and slave enslaving, but they're saying the feeling in the Bible that we are free to realize our own, we are free to obey Christ now instead of my list and so forth. So I'm just applying it to this. Free, not, we have no more obligation, right? Delivered from obligation. Okay, so I'm going to back up. That's the word, and then you can read all this. Literally, all this over here on the right side are places where that exact word is used again. Interesting, James down here, the law of liberty, the law of liberty, and of course Galatians verses with it. So, it, <laughs> um, 
That's what I'm saying. If you kind of get interested in it, you can go to a lot of verses. All right, so this is how you do the Greek. And so we'll go back to our original. There we are. There's Galatians 5. And then we could go have set free. And we look up and go, wow, it's about this exact same meaning. And you can look up the different ones. Stand firm is fascinating. Again, here's the thing. When you begin to understand any subject, suddenly it has so many facets and depth that a cursory look at it doesn't know. For example, maybe a really high level of physics. They're thinking with such depth and breadth and diversity on a level that I have a very low um, understanding of. So to me it's very flat. And that's what's fun about getting into the definitions and studying the words a little bit because then they start coming alive to you. Instead of being forced to listen to someone else teach you about the word, you can begin deeper study on the word yourself. And this, the Greek step-by-step -step is a really great way to do it. Um, let, me go, let me show you the word stand firm. So sc scroll down to the English in the middle. Everybody find the word stand firm? All right, so it comes, it says, stand firm, don't put on uh, the yoke of slavery. Let's look at this. Okay, stand firm, it also means to persevere. Kind of like keeping your standing Maintain your allegiance to freedom. So see, you can just read, 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 read. And there's all the forms in Greek if you want to memorize all those. Um, and then over here, looking. Okay, so again, stand firm. And I look somewhere else where I can show you another place. I'm just going to show you two places. I'm just going to take a little time with this tonight. All right. So we'll go back. This is what I want to show you. I'm going to show you one thing with verbs. And I'll use another website to remind you what it means. Okay, here's the thing about verbs. Verbs in English and in Greek tell you so much. Words in English can very quickly usually tell you time. For example, I was eating breakfast when... You know completely, you could draw the picture. You know that the next thing that happens is some action. That when you draw me, or you're, you're there you are with the oatmeal, you know, it's, is breakfast finished? No. Are you doing something else? No. I'm in the process of eating, and something happens. That's what English verbs are excellent at, and it's miserable for non-native speakers because it's so hard to understand. Greek is very specific in a different way. Their verbs tell you a lot of when and some specific information about the verb, about the verb in that tense or feeling. And so bear with me, I'm going to show you. So everybody see 1659? So go all the way to the right, and it tells you what kind of word is this. And the V tells us it's a what? Verb. Verb, yay, like third grade. <laughs> okay, but if I hold this on here, that tells me, and you can click on it, but it just has a list of the words. And so this particular site, if I clicked on that, it would tell me the different words. And so this is saying that this verb, like in English we have present, past, continuous, uh, perfect past, uh, continuous future. We have different versions, and this one, that first word, A-O, is pronounced aorist. It says the aorist tense. And you go, thank you, I have no idea what that means because we don't have one in English. So I will show you, and this is one place to, you can get this information, and then every time it comes up, you can remember, what does an aorist tense? Because it means something. Uh, can you tell me, look in the English, has set free. Can you tell me what, 
who did it or what kind? Was it a group of people? Um, when did it happen? When you look at English, has set free. How many people set somebody free? One. One, because it's has. That's just yes. he or she or it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's singular. And is it present, past, or future? Past. It's past. So we don't know what else was going on, but it, one person did it in the past. We know that. All right. So we're going to know more when we see the aorist tense in Greek. We turned this on, right? Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to go back up here and leave this website, and I'm going to go to the one called Precept Austin. Singular Precept and Austin. This is a website that is like getting your degree from seminary. There's so much information, commentaries, articles, devotionals. If you know Kay Arthur of Preset Ministries, this is solid, great material. Uh, except for things that don't matter, where style, their theology is so accurate. Different Bible um, hub is good, but it doesn't have all the commentaries and details. This is one, Precept Austin and Bible.org. I would trust anything they teach to you, except for areas that are that are peripheral where they can have a, an opinion that's different than mine. But I would trust or ours. Precept Austin. Okay, and see where it says Greek word studies? Yes. That's where you can learn a lot. And you can come for deeper information. So if you go to um, right here, you can click on the letters. Like if you wanted to look up um, stand or you wanted to look up Freedom. You could click on the letter and try and find it, and they will have a lot of information painting a bigger picture for you. Um, and from all kinds of commentaries, everything, they'll first explain it to you, and then they'll often give you lots and lots of good information gathered from many subjects. And that's why sometimes you go, well, I didn't get very far in my study, but it was very rich. Because this just opens up so much. And what they have done is all the research for you. So we just have to uh, use it. So we're not going to do that today. Instead, we're going to go right here. Of course, scroll back up to Related Resources, uh, Simple Guide to Greek Verb Tense. Because remember I said it had the aorist tense? And the problem is we don't know what the aorist tense is. It's very important. So scrolling down present tense, we have that in English. No problem. There we have the aorist tense. So again, it's past action. So we know that it is, and don't look at everything else. Just look at those big words printed in the second column. It says it's an effective action. It's successful. It's single. That means it just happened one time. It's not over and over and over. Okay. He fell, and he rolled, and he tumbled, and he slipped, and he fell over. It's not that. It's saying it's a one-time, single, successful action. That's the aorist tense. So when you are on Bible Hub or anywhere, and it says the A, it says it's aorist, then you know it's effective, successful, single action one time. So whatever happened in English, he set them free. We don't know if it worked or not. And this is saying at one time it was effective. Okay, right? Do you follow that question? I had a question mark on a face. Does somebody want to ask a question? Okay, so what tense is this? The aorist. Sounds like E-R-R. This is the aorist tense. And what does this tell us? It's how many times? Once. Once. Effective. What else? It's effective, it's successful. Mm -hmm. And it's um, yeah, one time. That's, it. that's it. Just one action. This happened, and it worked. It's what an amazing thing for for the tense to tell you that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Too bad we don't have it in English. All right. So now let's go back over to Galatians, where we go. Set us free. 
And we'll look at it and say, oh, it's heirs' tenants. Okay, set us, set us free right there. Heirs' tenants. So it's active. That means he did it. And by the way, the other word is here, I'm going to go back one more now and we'll look at this. Okay? So I'm going to come down to the ESV is what we've been using. So remember, this verb is a single, effective, one-time action. So, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So, does he have to set me free today and tomorrow and next week? No. Is this ongoing? No. See? We wouldn't have known that if we hadn't looked at the Greek. This is saying, what is this telling us about the freedom that we have in Christ with the law and with the security of our salvation and everything. What does the aorist tense tell us? It's done. Done. A done deed. It's a done deal. Mm -hmm. It's finished. It's done. So, your knowing that transforms us from just, oh, we have freedom in Christ not to obey the law, to go, he did it. Well, where did he do it? It's on the cross. It's on the cross. So, this is part of what he purchased on the cross. So even if you go back to Isaiah 53 where it says, He bore our griefs and our sorrows. He also bore our slavery so we could be set free. And He set me free. Does He have to set me free again? No. no. Mm -mm. Okay, now, am I walking in all the freedom in Christ and what He purchased for me? No. That's the messy sanctification part. And it's also understanding of what it says. Like I'm telling you right now. Think about an area that you don't feel, you feel that Christ would have you free because you're in some sort of legalistic bondage or something. He purchased that freedom for us in the cross. You do not have to keep that rule or list. I will tell you, for me, there's a freedom where I've been set free. Um, it is regret. Um, Always regretting, oh, I wish I'd known more, I wish I'd done more, I was unkind to them, messing my children up, not being the kind of wife I should have been. You just, you know, um, every time you teach, you go, oh, why did I do that? I shouldn't have done it that way, I should have done it this way. Really, your heart wants to do right, and you're just, it's a messy life. And whether it's real or not, that regret. I will tell you that on the cross, Christ set me free from regrets. But in real time life, it didn't happen until about two years ago out of Romans 8.28 where he convinced me that he works all things together for, good, for my good and for his glory. So I don't have to regret them because he uses everything. So even all my goof-ups and my mistakes, I'm not being frivolous about sin or hurting anybody. I'm talking about I apologize for those that want to correct them. But I'm talking about just the rest of life. I don't have, I really don't have any regrets anymore. So I have been set free and it's really happened to me. And I don't want to be encumbered anymore, or what does it say, entangled again in the yoke of slavery. Those are great words. Those actually, the Bereans actually have the words. It really is entangled. But it says submit again to the yoke of slavery. Okay, does that make sense to you? Okay, is there a question about how to use this or anything about it? I yes. noticed that both of the um, both of the websites have the same reference number for the words. Are they referencing a particular? Yes, they are. Oh, you are a detailed person. Wow. <laughs> I just go, oh. <laughs> wow. I need you like walking along, pointing things out to me. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't have more things to not regret. Um, <laughs> That's called that there was a comprehensive concordance written by a man named Strong. Mm -hmm. And it used to be in paperback, it was this thick. Mm -hmm. And it was every single word in the Bible, every single time it was listed. And so short definitions, and that's what it is. Yeah, and so you could go up there, I bet it says Strong from there somewhere. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Anywhere, you can just Google in Strong's. There. there it is. So it does have strong. So, <laughs> and unfortunately, it's KJV reference. So if you go to a Strong's 
and you use some word that's not out of the 16th, out of the 17th century, um, it may not show up. But that's what that was. So it's 7482 or whatever it was. And thank you for asking that because I just didn't think to say it. But that's what that is. Uh, other questions? Is that a resource to learn all the other like other verb tenses? Uh huh. Just exactly where we were. The old precept. Oh, it's Austin. Austin. Oh, we didn't even get through the title. It is yes. It goes all the way down and. You might want to go there as you begin doing this, because the, particularly the verbs. So you know what the verbs are saying, because there is another tense that's very important as well, because we don't have it in English. But this tells it doesn't have to be repeated one time. It was purchased at the cross, and so I want that freedom. And I, what can I do so I'm not foolish like the Galatians, and keep making my list of things that are going to make me earn God's favor, or help me to be more righteous. And that's my battle. Mm -hmm. And now I know who was bought at the cross. Mm -hmm. okay, anything else? I'm glad you went over, like if you just hold your mouse over the verb tense letters, uh -huh. that it shows you, because I had forgotten that and I couldn't figure out yeah. what verb form is this. Yeah. And when you click on it, it doesn't prove helpful. So, what? I was talking about, they have changed this too a little bit, but you see over here down this morphology, it just has letters, and if you click and go to the next page, it just has them all there, you have to try and figure it out. But if you just hover, it'll tell you what it is, and there you go, and so it says right there, okay, it's aorist, indicative, active. Okay, so I've done this a few times, so I know that what that means. That means active means somebody did to somebody else. So I didn't set myself free, it was done to me. And the I says it's the indicative mood which says absolute certainty. So it's not questionable. Because some things don't have indicative mood. It's just there. Like down below you see PMA and there are other verbs that don't have indicative. But when the Holy Spirit put something in had them put something indicative, go, you need to know you can take this to the bank. So we need to know it's absolutely true. Because of the cross, we are set free from this yoke of slavery of whatever our rule keeping is, whatever our list is for righteousness. And he did it one time, and it's effective. See how fantastic just one little insight on the verbs can be. Sometimes you look it all up and go, that didn't tell me anything. <laughs> but oftentimes it's like this. Any other questions or anything you need to go over or explain? Okay. Try now this week to do this. Um, you can quickly get into a, a lot. That is so much fun. Okay, so it's Bible Hub, you see up there, or Bible CC. And the other is Precept Austin, singular. And you at home, if you have a question, email me. I'll be glad to help you. Okay, so we're going to put our room back the way it was. And we'll go back to our word. Hope you found that interesting. It has opened an entire world in the Bible that was so flat to me before. It's so fun. Um, okay, let me go over a few of these words. Just as verse 1. And then I want you all to think and write on it yourself. Um, so the first word, for freedom, Christ has set us free. What does for say? What does for tell us? Because of. What? Because of something. Because of or the, It is for freedom. It's for the purpose of freedom. So we have freedom, sort of the purpose. It's for freedom. It's for this purpose that he set us free. He wants us to live in this freedom. That's why he bought freedom on the cross for us. Um, and I see I don't have to tell you what the words mean, because you now have them. Uh, it's rule keeping of any version. So you just keep looking at your house, your life, because most of us don't struggle with circumcision, which is the example he uses here. So what is your rule keeping, righteous rule keeping that you have? Um, then... 
He says, stand firm. This is a great word. And now the understanding of this, I really got it looking at, I think at the uh, precept often, because it's they spread it out. I can't remember where I got it. Okay, this is a great image, like you think of war movies. Now, if you don't know, I'm picky about movies, but one of the things I love, I love honor. I love movies of honor. And a lot of, a lot of good war movies have a lot of honor. They also have a lot of other stuff, so I always watch a filtered version, and I fast forward. So I filter it anyway, and then I go to it. So like a two-hour movie might be 45 minutes or an hour for me, depending on how much it is. Okay, but I really do love the nobility of it. And in a lot of them, there's, there's so many places where people are willing to give themselves for other people, even people they don't know. That's why it's so honorable. World War II movies, a lot of them. Mel Gibson has done them all through the ages. He has, I don't know how many, different war movies where he ends up with this kind of a stand. And Stand Firm has the idea of ground that's been fought for in a battle and won, and now we have to plant our feet and fight them off and not let them take it back over. Um, so if, World War II would be a perfect example of a war situation. Think of World War II where they're fighting and fighting and fighting. They've taken this ground, and then usually what happens, the colonel or captain or somebody comes and says, you have to keep this. We fought this. You can't give up this ground. Reinforcements aren't coming until tomorrow. Da 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 da. You're all of this, and they're surrounded. Battle of the Bulge was one of those, if you know anything about World War II. Um, and so then they say, you've got to stand firm and keep the ground that's already been fought for, sacrificed for, and keep it so we can continue to go forward. Okay? And in the n nobility of the sacrifice of war, Literally, their fallen comrades gave their life and their blood so that land, piece of land could be saved. Which is a physical picture mm -hmm. of the most wonderful thing mm -hmm. in all of history. Is that the precious spotless Lamb of God literally gave his blood, sacrificed his life for this freedom land that he purchased for each of us. And now this is saying, he did that for us, because he did that for us, let's stand firm. It's a war mentality. It's the same picture in Ephesians 6 where it says, therefore, stand firm with the helmet of salvation. It's a war picture. It's a battle thing, because it is a battle. And so here you can see it's the fighting. Um, he's fought and gained the free ground where we are free from the yoke of law, or having to earn his favor. And he's saying, don't give it up. Hold your position. Fight against the foe. Now sometimes the foe is me. Now sometimes the enemy's lying to me, Ephesians 6. He's attacking me. He's doing things. But sometimes I just lie to myself. And it's my flesh. It's history. It's, wow, look at other people. Whatever it is. But I have to fight off the foe because who gave his life that I would be free in this area. Jesus. Jesus. So put on those boots, stand there with the armor, and fight, because he's already won the freedom for us. See? Look how much I got from reading a little more about what that word means. Um, remember, instead of a physical place, this war is always fought on the turf of your heart. Always. So that's why we have to get up, put on our armor. That's why he says stand firm. It's already been won, now you have to stand firm. Get ready. There's a battle going to go on in the turf of your heart all day long. Some of you in here have told me the moment you wake up, it already starts sometimes. And your mind is going. Or you lie down to go to bed at night, it's going, 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 going. Okay? That's why he's saying, you got the Holy Spirit. Fight. Uh, don't submit. He says, don't submit yourself. We saw uh, the Berean version says, don't entangle yourself. It's a really physical picture. Not, don't get entangled 
with that yoke of slavery. This yoke is the same thing if you've ever heard anyone talk about when Jesus says, uh, Matthew, do I have him have it? Uh, take my yoke upon you, Matthew 22, I don't know where it is. It says, take my yoke upon you, and it's the double yoke of two oxen, and so it's the same idea, that we want to be the freedom, actually he's really teaching about the freedom of, from the law, is the, his yoke, that's his teaching. But in this case, we don't want to go back again and get all messed up and entangled in the yoke with slavery and rule keeping and law on the other side. Because they're going to be messing with us. And I can't, I'm going to be pulled around. And I might go, oh, that's true. I guess I got to go. And so then I just walk off with a yoke and slavery takes me. I mean, I'm enslaved with the yoke. So see, that's a great, again, great picture here. We have freedom from the yoke of law and rule keeping and our self work and our work and our law with him. Okay, any questions? Isn't that a great picture? Mm -hmm. This is why spend your time in the Word so you can be equipped for the battle. Because He equips us with His Spirit, He equips us with grace. He's already won the victory, but we have to fight for the freedom and the turf of our heart. Um, okay, we're going to start, stop, and I want you to do a couple things. I want you to think about first, where do you struggle in freedom from rule keeping and self-worth in your walk, in your life? And, or what are your hard battles to stand firm in the freedom that he purchased for you. He's already paid for it. Okay, It's already free land. Where, what are your struggles? Probably that may need to be private and just written. You at home, you get to write it all and discuss it with your friends. Okay, So that's the first. Okay, So I want you to say, where do you struggle? If you all are comfortable at your table, you can do it together. So I'll give you some time. And then I want you to do this. I want you to say... Because of what he's done, okay, because, okay, because of the cross, right, I am free, and then I want you to make a list, okay, my list, I mean, the list can be, I'm free not to have to have done it perfectly, I'm free not to carry the weight of my past or present failures, my sins, I'm free to be who you created me to be. I'm free to love and serve others instead of thinking I need it. So whatever it is, I'm free. I don't have to do this. I don't have to be who my mom thinks I should be. I'm free in that. I'm free. I don't have to nag my husband and make him be the man he's supposed to be or my children or my friends or my boss or whatever it is, whatever your list is. So what I want you to do at home, I want you to do this and um, I'm going to pray for us. And then you take your time, and then we'll do some work here until we're finished. Uh, is there a question or something that you'd like me to explain on camera? Good, they understand everything. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these wonderful resources. And I pray that you would uh, guide each person to stand firm on the, in the freedom that you purchased for her whatever that is. Thank you so much. We honor you right now. We glorify you that you are willing to come and live and go to the cross for us to purchase our freedom. Now, Holy Spirit, show each one of us where we can stand free instead of being entangled in the yoke of bondage of slavery to anything. To you be all the glory, honor, and praise. Amen. I did want to say one thing, okay? Okay. Some of this sometimes is a process. You know, like I told you, I was set free from regrets. Yeah, but we're talking about 65 years of regrets, okay? And pretty much I think that his truth has won for me that plot. Now I've got 10 million others, but that plot I think is really free. So battle it. That's what I'm saying. It's a battle. It's been won but I need to make it mine by the power of the Spirit.
by doing this kind of warfare, like Ephesians 6 says. Okay, so see you next time.